Thank you. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, my dissertation topic, the dolmens of the Southern Levant. And my um, research methods with that. So as we know, dolmens are not just in the Southern Levant. They're a global phenomenon, um, a good portion of them in Western Europe. Some in Asia, I'm focusing on the ones in the Levant and specifically in the Southern Levant. Um, so you can see there the global mapping of dolmens. Okay. So again, I'm working in the Southern Levant um, along that rift valley where you see the Dead Sea and the Kinneret. Um, I'm not working with the Northern Levant, with the dolmens in Lebanon and Syria. I'm often asked that. I'm not, they're not part of my doctorate. Um, so I'm leaving those to future, future work. Um, so again, the dolmens that you see there in the blue are what I'm focusing with. Um, in Jordan, I'm working with them there to the east of the Jordan River. Um, you can see there to the right in the yellow, um, the clustering of the dolmens in Jordan. And you can see to the north of the Kinneret are the ones I'm working with in Israel. Um, they go up, they're right to the border um, of Lebanon. But again, I'm not working with the ones in Syria and Lebanon at all. Okay. Um, just a little definition here of an actual dolmen is um, in the course of all my research, I'm finding that in the last couple hundred years, dolmens have been used to refer to pretty much anything made of megalithics. Um, so you can see um, on the left of the screen, that's a dolmen that's up in England. They do look like tables. Um, I have some friends that live in Northern Ireland and that's what he knows a dolmen looks like. The ones that we have in Israel and Jordan tend to look more like a box than a table, um, but it is a human-made structure of large stones uh, made of these upright stones. It looks, again, like a box or an above-ground cave, not necessarily a table-like structure. Okay. So again, it's been about 200 years of dolmen research. It started with Irby and Mangles, their first notice of a dolmen when they were um, traveling in the area in the mid 1800s. And the last you know, several hundred years of it's been surveys, um, especially Condor and Kitchener, they were one of the first ones to really survey the Levantine area and actually make real mentions of dolmens. Um, Turville Peter was one of them that, that actually really started um, excavating and examining the dolmens. Um, so as time has gone on, we've gone more from serving to actually excavating them. Then we have Fraser. Um, he did his dissertation in 2018, and one of his focuses was to really define what a dolmen is um, with that. So as we've been going through through the years, we've been improving and getting more detailed and more focused with our research on dolmens I and mean, getting away from just a visual um, examination of them into more of a scientific look at them and what they actually mean. Okay. One of the main things that has been looked at as far as dolmens over the years is typology of dolmens, because there's many different types of them not just the ones in Europe, but here in the Southern Levant, there's different types of them. So we have Epstein, um, she came up with the first very detailed typology of them um, with all of her work. Um, and she had subtypes to go with her types, which is very, very detailed. But Zohar realized um, it was too detailed, especially when you're out in the field surveying. So he came up with just six general types of dolmens. Same as Epstein, starting very, very simple and then getting more and more elaborate with them. And some of these types of dolmens are only found in one field and in one area. Um, as you'll see, I'll show you pictures of some of them. 
So it's been the main work with, with dolmens is this typology. Okay. And it seems like in the, as I've been doing my research, we've always been asking the same questions and doing the same thing. So I'm trying to, with my dissertation, bring in other interdisciplinary methods of looking at this, especially when it comes to the function and the chronology of these dolmens. Those seem to be the main areas that we're still asking the same questions about and still getting the same answers. So I'm trying to take it into a different, a different area. Okay, so let's look at some of the sites that I'm focusing on um, with my research. Okay, I'll start out with the ones here in Israel. We have Meshushim, um, which the, the dolmen site of Meshushim is one dolmen. It's all that's left of it. Um, we have Der Saras, where Claire Epstein did a lot of work surveying and excavating. Um, Yehudia as well is another area where she worked in. So these are large sites where work has been done and where um, I'll be doing some more work as well. Chorazim is another one that's had a lot of work done on it. Um, Tuva is a dolmen field where um, Ori Berger and I um, about a year ago surveyed the entire field. Um, that should be coming out here pretty soon um, with our survey. And so that's one of my main focus sites because nothing has been done with that site at all. There's never been excavation. So that's a field of focus um, for me in particular. Okay. Um, Ruja Mahiri, I'm not working with Ruja Mahiri specifically, but with the dolmens that are located in the area of Ruja Mahiri. Um, Shamir is you know, a, a very large field where we've done a lot of survey work, we've excavated, um, and that is a focus field um, for me just because of the amount of work that has been done and that I'm currently doing and will be doing. Um, the Dolmen field of Kella um, in the Golan, um, this field was not necessarily one I, that I would plan to work on, um, but because of salvage excavations um, that we started actually during the first lockdown, um, and we're gonna be doing some more salvage work. Um, this field has been opened up as one that I'm gonna be doing a lot of work with, which is it's really an amazing site. So I'm very lucky with that one. Okay, now we go over to Jordan. So you see there's a big difference in the dolmens between Israel and, and Jordan. The one in Israel, they're mostly basalt. There's a, a few limestone in Jordan. There are mostly limestone and very few of other types of stone. Um, so you see there, um, Maragat is, is one of the sites. Um, I've actually never been there. Um, I know that there's work being done there at the site. Um, you have Mutawak where Andrea Pacaro is excavating. Um, hopefully he's gonna be there this spring excavating a few more dolmens. And that's actually one of my classmates next to the dolmen. Um, then we have Damia, um, a very famous site. Um, it has the beautiful portal dolmens. Um, this site used to be called Allah Safat. That was where Stekalus did his dissertation. Um, it's not called Allah Safat anymore. It's called Damia. Um, so that's another field of my focus, just because of, again, the detail of work that's been done there. Tel Alumiri. Um, this is the site where um, inspired me to start working with dolmens. Um, this was where I first started working at all in archaeology. Um, this site is just south of Amman in Jordan. So you see these are the only two dolmens that are left. One is just a foundation and the other one is an almost intact dolmen. It was just missing its capstone and its front stone. Okay, what am I doing with all of these sites and all of these dolmens? I'm creating a very large database. Um, two databases, one where I am cataloging and recording all the information about every known dolmen field in the Southern Levant, Israel and Jordan. Anything that's been published, um, unpublished material that has been shared with me is all being recorded in it. And then as well as every single known 
Dolman in the Southern Levant. So a, a database of every field and every single Dolman within those fields and as much detailed information as possible. So that when we're researching dolmens, um, instead of going to libraries and websites and spending an enormous amount of time and energy looking for this data, I want it all in one easily accessible location um, so that we can easily research it um, and not kind of have to be um, remaking the wheel every time somebody wants to do a large project with these dolmens. So that's a major project of mine through the course of my doctoral work. Okay. And along with that, because um, we have wonderful GIS mapping technology nowadays, um, I'm using all the information I'm finding on these sites and these dolmens to create very detailed maps of all of the dolmen fields. Um, James Frazier did some um, in his dissertation, you see that on your screen. And the Antiquities Authority has also done um, very detailed mapping of the surveys that's on their survey website. So I'm crowdsourcing all of the GPS data for all the fields, all the dolmens, everything I can get my hands on. Um, and I have a, um, a GIS student at Tel High College that's um, currently working on making me maps of all the data that I've given her. So I want them, at the end, I want to have the most detailed maps and detailed database of Dolmans and Southern Levant that we have. Okay. So one of the questions with Dolmans has been what their actual function was, and it's been toyed around, you know, a lot of them are empty, there's no assemblages, there's not much material out there, but there is. Um, some of it's published, some of it isn't published, and it's not, um, you're not gonna see some of these really beautiful intact tombs. Some of the, the assemblages are just sherds and pieces, but after you know four or 5,000 years um, of all these dolmens which have been exposed um, to the elements and to reuse, um, any little bit of information we get from them is, is valuable. So I start with the Israeli dolmens and Shamir. Um, the clay-based soils that we get from, um, from basalt um, doesn't leave much um, as far as what's left. So we see there um, the assemblages, it's like pieces of bone and it's um, bits of pottery, sherds, not much of it's intact. Some of it's diagnostic, some of it isn't. There's just not much that the soil content and its moisture content has left us. But it's left us enough that we can see intermediate Bronze Age pottery sherds. We know that it's human remains. Once in a while we find some beads and, and other artifacts, but we know that it's a burial assemblage. Okay, this is what um, Claire Epstein excavated at Der Saras. So we know that from some of the dolmens we get beautifully intact materials. So you see the beautiful intermediate Bronze Age footed lamp and some arrow points and also um, some of the needles and other um, pins and things. So some dolmens have intact items left. It's not, it's not common. Others, there's just enough sherds to tell us what it was. Korazim, um, where Turgal Peter excavated many dolmens. Um, I'm still working on finding all of that material. That's one thing I'm looking at. I'm excavating, excavated material and storage areas. Um, so I'm working with the material that he saved from his excavations in the Korazim fields. Um, you see there a picture of the, the assemblages from the Keshet dolmens that Anya Kleiner at the IAA excavated very recently. And our publications um, in press on that, so you'll be able to read about um, that dolmen excavation here pretty soon. Um, so you can see they're intact footed lamps, um, a seven spouted lamp as well. And we had other um, pottery shirts, but those were our intact vessels from that excavation. Okay. Now we go over to Jordan, where you see a different preservation level of the material. 
in, in here in Israel, we do not find intact skeletons in the dolmens at all. In, Jor in Jordan, we do. And it's the difference between the very dry, arid soil where these burials are. So you see at Jabba Matawak, um, this is one of the burials that Andrea had excavated. You see an intact skull, human bones, pottery, um, a very complete and intact burial assemblage that you can do more work with. Damia, which again, it was Allah Safat when Shtekalus um, excavated it. Um, I'm very lucky in that this um, was excavated in Jordan, but the materials here in Israel because Shtekalus brought it back with him and it's stored here. So I actually get to work with that, which is wonderful. So again, in Israel, we find sherds. If I'm lucky, I find you know, those few intact lamps. In Jordan, we find complete intact whole vessels, um, like the ones you see there. Okay. And this is, again, the Tal Alamari dolmen that got me started. You see a very intact and very complete burial assemblage. Um, this dolmen was located at the bottom of the hill of the Tal was covered um, over the millennia. Um, when they first started excavating it, they thought it was another MB2 shaft tomb. Um, but it's not, it's an MB, it's an EB1, um, you can see from the pottery, dolmen. Um, very, very complete. Um, you can see a picture of the assemblage, all the whole pottery vessels, the lead handle jars, the high loop handle juglets. Um, the skeletons, um, again, very complete and intact. Skulls, um, long bones, some of them were articulated, so they were primary burials. Some were just um, identified by just a skull. Um, our MNI on this is currently 28 known individuals from prenatal um, through a middle aged individual. Um, so it's a wide ranging as far as who was actually buried in the tomb. And this is to date the most intact and complete dolmen assemblage that we know of in the Southern Levant. Okay, so again, what am I doing with all this assemblage material that I'm finding? I'm making a database with it. So again, instead of having to go through, you know, hundreds of publications to find um, all this material and to go find it in storage units wherever you find them. Um, the material is located in different countries, in different storage places in Jordan and Israel. Um, so I'm creating a database of all the material that I'm finding, as detailed as I can possibly be, including photographs, um, measurements, um, everything I can possibly get on all these assemblages um, so they can be studied. Um, and again, so that people don't have to go to all the ends of the earth to find the material in order to study these. Because there's a lot more material out there than people think it's just hard to find it. Okay, so again, what am I actually doing with all of this beyond the databases? Because that's not my doctorate, that's just part of my doctorate. Okay, I'm looking at the relative chronology. Um, as you saw with the, with the, assemblage material um, in Jordan. The dolmens tend to be all EB1, um, EB1A in some of the dolmen fields and EB1B in other of the fields, but they don't tend to go any later than that. And if they do, there's always EB1 material in the dolmen as well. So the, the earliest is always EB1. In Israel, you don't find EB1, two or three, you find intermediate Bronze Age in your dolmens. Um, so there's a, a break in the continuity there between the dolmens in these two areas. And part of what I'm doing with locating all of the material is over the last 200 years, we've changed our knowledge and um, gotten a tighter chronology in the region. So I'm re-examining some of the, the older material um, 
to reestablish the the dating on it and to some of it wasn't dated at all. Um, so I'm going back over that to um, re-examine the, the chronology of the pottery that's been found in the dolmens. One thing we find in dolmens in both Jordan and Israel are beads, um, specifically carnelian beads. We find them both in the EB1 dolmens and the IB dolmens. Um, so you see at Tal Alumeri and at Shamir, same exact types of carnelian beads. And we also find um, stone items. Okay, one thing that we find a lot of here in the dolmens in Israel are metal artifacts. So you see there from Shamir, Meshushim, and Bersarath, um, some of the metal artifacts as well. Um, and I've been working with Nama at, um, at Hebrew University, and we're going to be doing um, some analysis on the composition of the metal. Um, to see what that can tell us. So it's not just typology. We want to look at the actual composition, what that will tell us about the dolmens. Okay. Um, I am also looking at the interdisciplinary methods of radiocarbon dating. Um, for the dolmens in Jordan, the high preservation level of the skeletons does allow for radiocarbon dating. Um, Andrea Pacaro is working with that um, for Mutawak. Um, I don't have permission to share the results with you with that yet. Um, for Umeri, I can tell you we do have um, solid radiocarbon dating for that dolmen. Um, that will be coming out in a publication that goes with my dissertation. So it is possible to get radiocarbon dates from dolmens. It's not common at all because in, in Israel, we're not successful because the deterioration level on the bones just doesn't allow for radiocarbon dating. Um, part of the problem with the ones in Jordan is just finding this, the material from past excavations. So I'm relying on current excavations um, that have the material available um, and the funds available um, to do radiocarbon dating, but there, there are radiocarbon dates for dolmens. Okay. One of my major projects that I'm doing is I approach Nomi Parat at the Geological Survey of Israel to do um, OSL dating of dolmens. Because so many are found with nothing in them. There's no pottery pieces. There's no bone to even hope to try radiocarbon dating on. Um, so I approached her to use OSL um, to actually date the dolmens with. Um, we started with Shamir. We went on a tour with her to different fields and Ori Berger went with us and we narrowed it down to Shamir being our target to start with because we had excavated material from there. We had relative chronology material for comparison. Um, so we started with Shamir and we got good results with Shamir. When the Kala salvage dig came up, um, we got more material from there and started doing more dating. Um, so OSL we do know is successful and we're working more um, with Nomi and getting more dates on that and using that as a way to, to date the dolmens. And I don't have any plans to do this in Jordan right now. Um, it's just not feasible to do this in two different countries at this time. Okay. One project as well, as you saw the Umeri dolmen, um, skeletons were very well preserved. You see them here in the picture, those were in the lab. Um, their high level of preservation allowed for um, ancient DNA. The, um, the DNA lab at Adelaide University, um, one of the PhD students and I have teamed up on this. We do have very good results with the DNA on this. Um, so hopefully this year the publication will come out and we can share it with you. Um, but hopefully that will be able to answer um, some of the questions with the dolmens that we have. Okay. Thank you.